Okay, we'll get started uh, here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first outreach meeting with the public on the development of the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Plan. My name is Drew Kaiser, and I'm the uh, Senior Environmental Scientist with the Native Plant Program at CDFW, uh, and I am the technical lead for the working group that is developing the plan. Um, just to let everyone know that we are recording this meeting uh, and it will be posted on our website so that you all can refer back to it when formulating comments and feedback. So during this meeting, uh, we're going to be going over a brief overview of the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act. Uh, and give you an update on the implementation of the permitting systems created by the Act thus far. Uh, the main focus of this meeting, however, will be to present some of the strategies that are in uh, strategies and broad issues the conservation plan will attempt to address and the and to gather feedback and issues of concern from you all that you would like to see addressed in the conservation plan. Uh, during the information gathering session, after the presented materials, you will have an opportunity to provide comments in an orderly fashion. Uh, you can also provide comments in written form to wjt at wildlife.ca.gov. Comments will be compiled and, to, and taken into consideration when the plan is being developed. And just a note, this is going to be the first of two outreach meetings with, that we will be holding with the public. Uh, once key details of the plan are developed, we will present them at the second outreach meeting for further feedback. So before we discuss conservation plan, we wanted to provide a little background information on the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act, which requires the development of the conservation plan. So in October of 2019, the Fish and Game Commission received a petition from the Center for Biological Diversity to list the Western Joshua tree as a threatened species. CDFW is required to evaluate and review all petitions. In September of 2020, CDFW submitted the evaluation of the petition and the Fish and Game Commission determined that there was sufficient evidence to consider listing under the California Endangered Species Act or CESA that is when the CESA candidacy period began and protections first went into effect. March 2022, CDFW presented the status review to the Fish and Game Commission. The status review evaluated all the research and current threats, and it was a very close call for our staff, but we ultimately made the recommendation not to list at this time. In June of 2022, the Fish and Game Com Commission considered the status review. Public comments were also taken at this meeting. And after two votes, one to list and one to not list, the Fish and Game Commission was not able to agree on a listing status. And, and at that meeting, the decision was continued to a future meeting and the record was held open to receive additional comments from tribal partners. Subsequently, the species remains a candidate under CESA to this day. In February of 2023, the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act was introduced into the California legislature in a budget trailer bill, and it contained the original language of the act. This language protects the species, but offers a path forward for economic development and meeting the state's renewable energy goals. In July of 2023, Trailer Bill SB 122 passed and was signed by the governor. There were some substantial changes from the original language, but the intent was the same. So as mentioned, uh, the species remains a candidate under the California Endangered Species Act to this day, meaning that it has all the same protections as a fully listed species. However, the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act creates similar protections that work in tandem with CESA, as well as in scenarios if the Fishing Game Commission decides to list the Joshua Tree or not. The Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act differs from CESA in that it also provides a few other avenues to facilitate conservation of the species that would otherwise be prohibited under CESA. It creates new permitting systems for managing Joshua trees, 
And these permitting systems will be covered later, but it is important to note here that the act creates a fee schedule to take fees or take trees uh, in lieu of compensatory mitigation. Those fees go into the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Fund, and the purpose of this fund is to conserve the species through land acquisitions and conservation easements in high quality Western Joshua Tree habitat. It can also fund the enhancement, restoration, management, and monitoring of Western Joshua Tree habitat. The Act also requires that CDFW create a conservation plan with the input of agencies, California Native American tribes, and the public by the end of this year. And then one of the last things the Act does is it requires the Fish and Game Commission to reconsider listing under CESA in 2033. So in a sense, this puts their decision on hold unless they deem the uh, unless they deem the conservation plan and the actions are not doing enough to conserve the species and it decides it needs the full protections of CESA. So with that, we're gonna go over the permitting systems created by the Act and provide a brief status update on its implementation so far. So the two main permitting systems created by the Act that are currently being implemented by CDFW are the Hazard Management Permit System and the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act Incidental Take Permit System, which should not be confused with the CESA Incidental Take Permits. There's also language in the Act that allows for the possession and distribution, including sale of Western Joshua Tree for conservation and recovery purposes. And so CDFW is currently evaluating conditions and guidelines that would be needed to appropriately permit this activity. The purpose of the hazard management permit system is to create a streamlined legal mechanism to trim or remove dead trees or trim live trees that are a hazard to human health and safety. There is no option for removing live trees under this permitting system. To qualify for these permits, trees or limbs must meet certain conditions. They have either fallen over and are within 30 feet of a structure, they are leaning against a, a, an existing structure, or they are creating an imminent, health, uh, imminent threat to public health and safety. The Act also requires a desert native plant specialist in certain situations. The Act defines a designated plant specialist as an individual with at least five years of professional experience with relocation or restoration of native California desert vegetation, or an arborist that is certified by the International Society of Arboriculture. With regard to hazard management permits, only desert native plant specialists can trim a live tree or remove a dead tree that is still rooted in the ground. Detached trees or limbs may be removed by the property owner. And so we won't go over the application process in detail, uh, but you should know that these permits are available now on our website, along with instructions on what types of information we need in order to process applications. And so to date, uh, CEFW has issued 178 of these permits to residents and utility companies. Uh, as you can expect, we see uh, we usually see an influx after big storm events. Um, most of the requests have been due to fallen limbs or trees, which is not uncommon for the species. Heavily saturated soils and strong winds can weaken branches and loosen roots, causing them to detach or fully uproot. We have also seen some insect-related damage. This is evident through the yellowing or loss of leaves on some of the branch tips of an otherwise healthy looking Joshua tree. We have also seen instances where carpenter bees and, or, and rodents, including grofers, have damaged the base of trunks, uh, causing them to break off at ground level or just above. Natural mortality has also been observed, but in relatively low numbers. So now we're going to briefly walk through the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act incidental take permits. 
In order to get an ITP to remove or relocate Western Joshua Tree for a development project, the, per the permittee must meet certain conditions. The first is that the permittee must submit a census of all Western Joshua trees within the project area, regardless if they are being taken or not. The census must include photographs of each tree and their size according to three categories, less than one meter, one meter or greater, but less than five meters, or five meters or greater. The census will also ask for some additional information, like whether the tree is producing flowers or fruits, whether the tree is alive or dead, and if there is a plan to relocate the tree and where. To help permittees collect and send this information, we created a form on Survey123, which is a free app. We have instructions on our website that walk you through this process. The second condition is that the permittee must avoid and minimize impacts to Western Joshua Tree to the greatest extent practicable. So we have been developing a set of measures that can be incorporated into ITPs on a project by project basis. Factors affecting which measures get used will depend on the level of impact. Are we talking about a few trees in someone's backyard or a few hundred? CDFW can also require that permittees relocate trees according to our guidelines, which are still in development. The permittee would also have to implement measures to assist in the survival of trees to the greatest extent practicable, which will include monitoring and watering for a certain length of time after trees are relocated. Lastly, the act says that the permittee must mitigate all impacts to and taking up Western Joshua tree which for the purposes of the act will include paying fees based on their size. And these fees will go into the conservation fund. So CDFW began receiving these ITPs and uh, applications in September. Uh, and as you all may know, uh, many of the projects that did not produce, pursue a CISA ITP were essentially put on hold. Currently, we have received 70, uh, 69 applications and are diligently working through the backlog. The types of projects varies widely, and so there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to them. So CDFW developed these avoidance and minimization measures that are included on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, some of these measures include establishing avoidance buffers around individual trees based on their size, requiring seed collection and relocation, which we'll give an update on in the next slide. Uh, integrated pest management best practices, um, just including them directly into permits as opposed to requiring the submittal of a plan. And then requiring a designated biologist or designated plant specialist in some situations, but not all. And then the last is reporting. And so we know that there's been a lot of interest in the development of these protocols, and we just want to let you know that we are still in the process right now. Uh, we decided to include seed collection uh, as a measure because it is a relatively low effort activity that can have extremely beneficial uh, conservation purposes. Seed banking preserves genetic diversity, and then we can also use the seed for future restoration projects. The, this protocol will cover everything from conditions where seed collection would be required, methods for scouting seed maturity, processing, storage, as well as some suggested repositories for long-term storage. The relocation protocols cover a variety of methods from bare root transplanting to tree spade techniques, all of which would be based on size, and then it will, be, it will also provide uh, measures to assist in the care and maintenance of translocated trees. But some of the issues that we're working through right now are establishing receiver sites. And so far, we've heard from a number of land managers that are interested in being receiver sites to restore their degraded Joshua tree woodlands. Um, however, we are looking for more over a wider area because we do not want to move trees too far from the original location. 
Um, and so we also need to be thinking about what can we be what can we do to keep relocated trees near project sites? Can they be incorporated into landscaping? Can areas be devoted to demonstration gardens on site? Another possible avenue we may try would be to establish an Adopt Joshua Tree program where individuals can request to have Joshua trees relocated to their property. And so the act does provide some provisions that for those that accept relocated Joshua trees, first is that the permittee, not the recipient, will be responsible for implementing measures to assist in the survival of these relocated trees. So as mentioned before, this will include watering and monitoring for a certain length of time. However, if the landowner would prefer to maintain relocated Joshua trees themselves, I'm sure that can be worked out. The second is that the landowner, the landowner that agrees in writing to allow Western Joshua trees to be re relocated onto their land shall not be liable for their continued survival and that they, um, that they are not required to manage or maintain the relocated Joshua trees uh, and they are not required to change existing land use practices provided that the land use practices do not result in the taking, possession, sale, or further translocation of those trees. So the act also allows for an additional activity that was not previously authorized by CESA. Section 1927.2 H allows for CDFW to issue permits or memorandum of understanding for the taking, possession, purchase, or sale of Western Joshua Tree within California to aid in conservation and recovery purposes. This is similar to our 2081A regulations, but also allows for the sale and distribution of Western Joshua Tree for those purposes. And so we are evaluating conditions and guidelines that could accommodate this, which we are calling our Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act Conservation and Recovery Permits. And so we've received several inquiries from organizations that have done this very thing in the past before the candidacy period began and protections went into the place. Uh, these organizations vary from water districts implementing native planting programs to nurseries assisting in restoration efforts. And then we also wanted to point out that these are not the only permits that are available. So while the species remains a candidate under CESA, the ex these existing permitting mechanisms are available for man managing Joshua trees. And they are the CESA incidental take permits, natural community conservation plans, safe harbor agreements, voluntary local programs, and then our scientific educational or management permits or 2081A. Okay, so now uh, we're going to get to the purpose of this meeting, which is to present some strategies that are in the early stages of development and to gather feedback from you all. So the vision of the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Plan is to prevent the extinction of Western Joshua Tree in the wild, preserve, eco preserve eco functioning ecosystems that support Western Joshua Tree, and maintain sustainable populations of Western Joshua tree in California over the long term. The act says that we must do this in collaboration with the Fish and Game Commission, government agencies, California Native American tribes, and the public. So the act also defines some of the overarching goals that need to be included in the plan including management actions necessary to conserve the species, objective measurable criteria to assess the effectiveness of those actions, guidance for the avoidance and minimization of impacts to Western Joshua Tree, relocation guidelines and protocols, and collaboration with California Native American tribes to include co-management principles, incorporate traditional ecological knowledge, and to provide for the relocation of Western Joshua Tree to tribal lands upon request. 
And so uh, if we break this down, some of the major management action themes might include guidance for avoiding both direct and indirect impacts. And when avoidance is not possible, how can we best minimize those impacts? We need to be thinking about the priorities for land conservation and where it makes the most sense in order to maximize the funds to make meaningful conservation. And then we need to be working with California Native American tribes to identify and incorporate traditional ecological knowledge that can assist in these efforts. And then we need to also be thinking about how we're going to define success for meeting our objectives. And then, you know, we we need input from the public here. You know, are there other major themes that we should be considering? Uh, please let us know. And so we know that there's a full suite of activities that could impact Joshua trees. Um, and one of the biggest threats to Joshua trees over the long term is climate change. But what are the things that we can control? The conservation plan will dive into each one of these subjects while recognizing that the species is widespread within urban areas. There are probably hundreds of thousands of people living with these trees in their yard. And so this slide is meant to be thought provoking and a conversation starter. How can we best avoid killing trees? What distances are appropriate? Does this differ based on their life stage? And then how can we minimize impacts when we do encroach on these buffers? To maintain populations over the long term, how can we best preserve the seed bank? What can we be doing to avoid or minimize high intensity wildfire in Western Joshua tree habitat? And then what other activities may negatively impact Western Joshua tree and what measures exist to help minimize these impacts? To help avoid and minimize indirect impacts, what practices should be used to prevent invasive species impacts? How can we best prevent soil erosion? Nurse plants are crucial for the growth of populations. How can we best preserve them? Connectivity will be important for tree and pollinator migration in the future, and so we must be taking that into consideration. And how else can we be looking after their yucca moth pollinators? Again, what are we missing here? Uh, let us know, um, but these are just some of the big questions that the conservation plan is hoping to address. And here is your opportunity to help us. So last year, we created some initial guidance for prioritizing land conservation uh, when we announced our request for qualifications to bring on a consultant to help us uh, in these efforts. And so these were some of the criteria that we developed, um, and we would like feedback from you all. Um, what other factors should we be considering when prioritizing land conservation? So obviously the species is widespread over a wide geographic area with many jurisdictions. And so the, the conservation plan will need to provide guidance for a number of approaches to conserve and protect the species with collaboration and consensus being imperative to making meaningful conservation. How can we best incorporate state lands into the conservation strategy? What, all, what would you all see as appropriate measures for a conservation agreement with federal partners? How can we maximize the use of the conservation fund to acquire private land and establish conservation easements in critical areas? And then what sort of long-term maintenance or enhancement activities should be carried out on these conserved lands? Tribal co-management and traditional ecological knowledge are becoming more common in the field of species and habitat conservation. And it is such a big part of the conservation, uh, Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act. And so we are currently reaching out to the, set up meetings with the 70 or so Native American tribes within the range to discuss where we can partner and the best ways to do that. 
some of the strategies uh, we are considering is asking, you know, where do lands of important tribal significance and climate refugia overlap? Can we partner with the with the tribes to co-manage these areas? Uh, can memorandum of understanding be developed to carry out traditional and or contemporary land stewardship practices with tribes? Um, and then, you know, can we or you know we might be able to fund local tribal conservation crews to carry out this work are tribes interested in filling land roles such as title holder conservation easement holders or land managers and should we form a tribal advisory committee to help coordinate these efforts and then what traditional ecological knowledge exists out there to help nature tree habitats thrive and how can we best support these efforts? And so the state is limited in the amount of levers we can pull to implement these management actions. And so we have some authority like with permitting and the uses of the conservation fund, but the approach will need to extend beyond those mechanisms to effectively conserve the species throughout its range. Some ideas might include forming federal, state, and local uh, conservation agreements, establishing co-management agreements with tribes to carry out uh, these land stewardship practices, um, supporting local recovery efforts, and bolstering education and outreach opportunities with the public. So lastly, we recognize that there are some substantial gaps in the literature. Uh, however, we know that there's a lot of good research that is currently underway. And so we have already met with many of these researchers. And um, but, you know, what are some of the best ways that the state can support these efforts to fill in the gaps to make science based formed decision informed decisions? Okay, so before we get into the open forum, uh, we just wanted to point out that the timeline to get the input into the conservation plan is incredibly short. The entire plan must be uh, finished by December of 2024, meaning that um, we need to receive input from, and feedback from you all as soon as possible. There will be opportunities to amend the plan in the future but this first draft will serve as the framework for Western Joshua Tree Conservation. The input from the comments we receive will be considered when flushing out some of the details. Uh, we may reach back out to you all directly to ask clarifying questions. And then in a couple months from now, we'll hold a second outreach meeting that will be similar to this meeting's format where we present ideas and content and then gather feedback. And then we would also like to point out that the ultimate decision to adopt the plan rests with the Fish and Game Commission. And so after CDFW submits the draft plan to them in December, there will be additional opportunities to provide comment. However, this is your best chance to get in on the ground floor and help shape the conservation plan. So please consider working with us to help grow clean energy, develop responsibly, and protect the amazing biodiversity of our California deserts.